Hello, everyone. It is Tuesday, July 13, 2021. This is Professor Hamamoto, and today I'll be talking about a fantastic book that I had uh, found in my collection. It was squirreled away while I was moving around, and I'm glad I found it because it's really relevant to today, 2021 the current uh, biomedical tyranny that is being enforced upon us against our will, of course. Back then, it was done willingly by these patients of um, uh, Dr. Max Jakobsen, or I might call him Jacobson, but Max Jakobsen. And um, these, these are, this is a system that's very much in place today where People in power positions, whether they be entertainment figures, and I gave a talk previously on Paris Hilton and um, Britney Spears, among other people, uh, actors, performers, writers, playwrights, musicians, of course. And I don't do that simply for the clickbait potential of these names. I do that as the author's attempt here in this book, and I think they succeed for the most part. I do it with the intention of trying to understand the larger socio-cultural and political economic system. It sounds grandiose, but <laughs> but guess what? We are we as ordinary everyday people who are similarly, by the way, uh, dosed up. Uh, it's become the norm. Back then in the '60s, this was experimental, pioneering pharmaceutical practice. Uh, but today, unfortunately, it's become uh, not only normal and routinized and institutionalized, but soon it might even become mandatory, just like everything else in this society of ours, this uh, post-technology society, post-genetic society, where everything is going to be rigidly controlled. So for that reason also, this is, uh, I believe, uh, an instructive talk that I will be giving today. First of all, before I begin, I'd like to welcome uh, Corky Goss, and um, he's on to a, a perception. I'm going to leave it to him to check up on it. <laughs> I dropped the name Jacobson or Jacobson in another context, and he's going to be checking something out. There might be a, an interesting connection there biographically and professionally. And Ekat, um, welcome. Uh, Ekat, I'm going to have to invite you on as a guest one of these days. We'll find and hope maybe if I had some some time, this would have been a great opportunity because you had a very perceptive comment on the pre, uh, the preview of the show, which I'll get to in a minute. And Ayape, greetings, greetings. And Carlos Gonzalez, yes, Sean Lenane, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, welcome all. And I'm going to try to pay a little bit more attention to the chat because some of you might have some <laughs> direct or at least indirect ex experience with some of these figures or their relatives or their businessman or whoever. You know, it's, we're all connected uh, in, in an eerily uh, close fashion, right? You know, the, you, you know about the six degrees of separation. For a lot of us, it's only two or three. So I'm going to try to follow up on, or keep an eye on that. So this is the book. Um, it's uh, Dr. Feelgood. Don't be put off by the the title. It seems to sound kind of trivialized, but that was his code name. This is a, the code name of a doctor. He's a medical doctor, MD, Dr. Max Jacobson or Jacobson. I'll say Jacobson since he was in the American context for uh, most of his professional life. Jacobson. I don't know how he addressed himself, probably J Jacobson or Dr. Max, but he was known as Dr. Feelgood. That was his code name by the U.S. Secret Service, because as we'll find out presently, Dr. Max or Dr. Jacobson had almost unfettered access to the White House under President, our beloved martyred President, John F. Kennedy, and he had access to the highest reaches of government and the people who run it. And that also is quite instructive for today, 2021. I'll just go ahead and say it. We are probably being lorded over and um, bullied and uh, dictated by a group of people who are completely whacked out 
We know about the Silicon Valley obsession with microdosing LSD, do we not? And I have referred to them in the past as the hallucinati, right? And these are the people who are in charge of our perceptions, our communications, our perceptions, our consciousness. And uh, we know enough about uh, the medical history of the failed candidacy of one mm, Clinton and uh, her husband who never inhaled a, a drug that he didn't like and on and on. And we, you know, we, we know these stories are pretty common and that's part of the problem in doing one of these talks is that we've become ourselves so habituated to a lot of this conspiracy hype that, ah, uh, yeah, I've been there. I don't need to, I don't need to pay attention. Yeah. Yeah. I, I got it. I got you. Yeah. And that's the most difficult challenge for me who attempts and, and achieves his uh, objectives quite often to go beyond just the, the general background noise of people who are supposedly really in touch with the latest and break, uh, latest and greatest fast breaking new underground information. That's us, right? That was you and me, you know, uh, at, at one point in our careers. And I get these comments all the time. Yeah, you, you, you should check out so-and-so or, or dig somebody so-and-so. Say, so, yeah, been there, done that. Go to some other channel where you can really educate someone because it's pretty unlikely that I haven't really been there already. But for those of you who remain, thank you very much. Um, this book is written by two great authors of great uh, insight and, and observational and analytical powers. And uh, I think they're both uh, from the world of journalism. Yes, uh, Richard Lertzman, he's the, uh, well, it's a, it's a co-authored book, so I won't say who the principal author is, but Richard A. Lertzman is a former editor and publisher of Screen Scene. So he knows a lot about the celebrity histories, which is something that, I, as you know, I'm very much interested in. But he's also uh, very perceptive so far as understanding, and I'll get to this in a moment, what the meaning of celebrity is. And unfortunately, all these conspiracy sites, you see, they take it at celebrity at face value and they get off on mocking someone. So, oh, yes, uh, yeah, Britney Spears shaved her hand. You know, and they just leave it at that. Well, oh, yeah. And they just, you know, it's just very frustrating. And uh, the, the other, the co-author is William J. Burns, PhD. He has a doctorate um, and he's an editor, publisher, literary agent and a television producer. He's a New York Times bestselling author. So they have bona fides. They, they didn't come from nowhere. And uh, as I'll get to in a moment, there the and this is what's, I think, probably the most important part of this book here, is that they connect, as most people don't, who supposedly do original research and celebrity exposés. These two authors connect the world of celebrity to the world of political power, medical power, pharmaceutical medical power, pouvoir, as they say in French theory, which holds us in bondage. As I stated earlier, very relevant to our present situation. Now, let me move on because one of the uh, smart ass critics said, ah, you're, you're just going on and on and on and just get to the point. Well, jerk wad, why don't you watch some other channel, you know, or, or get back to your video game because uh, my style is my style and my way of delivering information is my own. And if you can't handle it, don't even bother leaving a comment. And he went away butthurt and he told me, I'm unsubscribing from your channel. Good riddance, dickhead. I've taught for 30, 40 years, and I dealt with dickheads like you in the classroom. <laughs> and now I can call you a dickhead, and you have nobody to report me to. You can't go to the dean and cry that Professor Hamamoto is mean to me, and he's not creating a very supportive and safe space environment. All right, enough for the rant. Um, I'm, I'm done with, with you uh, jerkwads, all right? game heads and maybe that's your your uh your equivalent of uh methamphetamine maybe that's your feel-good drug of choice and uh, that's not much of a stretch so let me give you a um, partial list and this might not mean anything to some people because dr jacobson's golden age let's call it was from the 50s and 60s by the time the 70s you know everybody was doing these this, these types of quote-unquote alternative 
uh, preparations and, and treatment. So they had to, kind of, they meaning the medical establishment were kind of embarrassed by it and they had to push him out. And that's a obj object lesson for all you really cool cutting edge people who think you're really uh, contributing some sort of medical or tech, uh, technological innovation that's going to save humanity or reduce human suffering, which is really uh, a front for control, political, biopolitical control. For all you people who are wrapped up in that, think again, because you're going to be uh, rolled up one day, probably sooner than later. So enjoy it while you can, just like Dr. Feelgood is supposedly was a, a humanist and, and did his good works for the benefit of humanity. But indeed, it, as I'll get to in a moment, um, he probably was a, a, a snitch, an intelligence rat, just like a lot of you people, including that woman, uh, that physician who says, yes, we got to make it very difficult for people to 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 not comply with our new medical dictatorship. You're an embarrassment lady, and you're gonna get rolled up. What's your name, Win? Yeah, was your dad some sort of uh, snitch back in uh, South Vietnam working for the US Army or the CIA, ratting out other Vietnamese people so that they could be assassinated? That's probably your family background. I know your number. I, I had students like you, so just crawl back in your hole and, uh, and go away. Go away for a long, long time. So people like uh, Dr. Uh, Yakison have a lot of descendants, you know, in 2021. But let me show you the list of cl uh, clients that he had. One was Billy Wilder, and he's a famous director. In fact, he, you know, he, English wasn't even his first language, but he was directing people like Marilyn Monroe and gentlemen prefer blondes in the apartment. All these great comedies of the late 50s and 1960s, at least I think they're great. And his writing partner was uh, I.A.L. Diamond, for you trivia buffs. I think he was American, but Wilder was was the uh, cinema genius, right? Uh, just for your back. And, you know, check him out if you want. You've probably seen his films. You just don't know his name. And, and I'm mentioning these people at the front because they were uh, either Austrian or German expats in New York, entertainment people, writers, directors, performers, and musicians, uh, performing artists, right? And, um, and as such, uh, Dr. Max uh, Jacobson had a built-in clientele. And I don't think that was accidental, because as I'll get to in a moment, I think Jacobson was used in order to help control this expatriate community. Many of them were professed, uh, had professed loyalty, un unqualified loyalty to their adopted homeland, the United States of America. People like Marlena Dietrich, and Marlena Dietrich, by the way, was, was a patient of uh, Dr. Uh, Jacobson. And she, during the World War II period, was very much involved in morale enhancing efforts, propaganda efforts on the behalf of the United States of America. And another person who comes from the old country, right, was Hedy Lamar, the beautiful actress Hedy Lamar. Supposedly, she was involved with, um, let's see, what's his name? George uh, Antiel, the the, um, the avant-garde composer in, in L.A. and Hollywood. I think he might have done some movies, too. But supposedly, George Antiel and Hedy Lamar invented what later become, became... Um, uh, sensing devices or, or radar, something to do with radar and, and tracking um, uh, underwater threats, right? Such as, um, well, who knows, armaments for, for World War II. And, I, and, I, I and I've read the Hedy Lamar stories, and uh, I think she was mostly a courier for technology that had been stole, stolen from either Germany. Um, her, her first husband, by the way, was an industrialist, a German industrialist or from the Soviets. Anyway, I don't want to get bogged down too much in the background of these people. And uh, another expat was uh, the great Peter Lani. And I mentioned to you Peter Lani before in conjunction with the great film M, M right, with uh, directed by Fritz Lang. And of course, Peter Lorre, you've seen him in all the great horror films of the 50s and 60s. And probably, and he was a, a dopehead himself. And I don't mean that disparagingly, because as you'll find out, uh, most of our leaders and cultural icons of the 50s and 60s were dopeheads. Why, ladies and gentlemen, I, and I don't want to encourage uh, anybody listening 
uh, to pursue or follow up <laughs> on these uh, possibilities. I mean, I have uh, different approaches myself. One is, you know, tuning, right? All right, this is the Schumann resonance. Resonance. So you don't have to go drug the drug route. Here, here's another one. Here's a tower buster of my friend uh, Masaki uh, Miyagawa Masaki. He's also a numerologist. So there are there are workarounds that um, that are that are um, I won't say is equally as effective, but drugs drugs do work. That's what I wanted to tell you. They do do work immediately almost, but their long term consequences are not good. Uh, this, so far as I know, won't, won't destroy your liver and your heart and your brain <laughs> and your internal organs, as far as I know. But maybe people are working on a way to weaponize this. I wouldn't put it out of their uh, their reach, you know, they're always figuring out ways to um, screw humanity over. They meaning these technologists and scientists, which have uh, Dr. Jacobson identified himself very much as a man of science. And I mentioned this because for the most part, really, he was more like a shaman. He was more like a um, or shaman, if you will. Uh, shaman, shaman, potato, potato. Let's call the whole thing off. Right. You heard the song. Uh, he was more of a healer, too. And that's an important part of the story, because when he was coming up as a medical student back in Berlin, all his uh, mentors, as well as himself, did not have at their disposal all these diagnostic pieces of equipment, right? Radiology and... Um, X-ray, you know, all that type of a diag. And, and today, it's all about putting you through a whole diagnostic regimen to come up with probably a very mundane course of treatment, uh, so long as it pays the insurance companies handsomely. But back then, you had, uh, as a physician, you had to really listen to the patient. You really had to almost, in a sense, look into their soul. And I mention this is because I think this is the way. The primary way that that Dr. Jacobson was able to amass such a preeminent list of uh, celebrity clients for his medical practice up on 72nd Street in the in New York City, right? So you had the German and Austrian expats, you had Elvis. That's how we say Elvis down south, you know, and down in Memphis. Uh, that's Elvis, Elvis Presley, and I don't need to. To tell you about his issue, you know that the king died on the throne, right? He died of some sort of uh, organ collapse after a, a, a lifetime of being kept high and on meth by uh, Dr. Max Jacobs and other people. I think his personal physician down in Memphis was a guy named Dr. Niarcos. Anyway, they hang, hung him up to dry, too. So any of you medical doctors or dentists, whoever can write prescriptions, or, or psychotherapists, I think you can write prescriptions, too, who are treating your patients. Uh, your name's on the list, and whenever your time is expired, they're going to pull the plug on you, just like they did with the guy who treated Michael Jackson. They hung him out to dry. I can't re remember his name. This is out in L.A. I think he's in prison right now. Uh, so Tom Parker, that's Colonel Tom Parker. By the way, Tom Parker was not even a Kentucky or a Southern colonel. Uh, you know, Dr. Jacobson was a, came from the Third Reich. That's American history for you. Uh, Tom Parker was a Polish immigrant. <laughs> Most people don't know that he spoke with a Slavic accent, not a Kentucky Colonel drawl. He was an old-time circus barker, sideshow type of hustler. And that's the kind of people we like in America. We need more Colonel Tom Parker types. And the writer Gore Vidal, his name has come up in previous talks. He's the guy that wrote... Um, Ira Breckenridge later made into a movie. He's uh, he's he was a public intellectual. He's written for TV. He was on television a lot. Uh, he got into big fights uh, on uh, the Dick Cavett show with people like uh, uh, Norman Mailer. I don't know if Norman Mailer was a patient of uh, Doctor Jacobson. He was in New York at the time. I wouldn't be surprised if he got treatment. And uh, Tennessee Williams, who was um, sort of a rival, I'd say, to Gore Vidal. Uh, Jacobson had a lot of great novelists on his <laughs> patient list. So like I say, you know, uh, these guys put, uh, produce, and women, a lot of women, is it like, you know, Ingrid Bergman, right, the, the actress. 
um, they produced results. Or, but on the other hand, these people are were already super talented, right? So I won't say that that the drugs themselves had anything to do. Well, I mean, I won't say that the drugs are responsible for their genius. Their genius preceded the drugs. That's what I'm trying to get at. This was kind of in uh, Truman Capote, right? In Cold Blood, um, uh, all those great, um, uh, he wrote Breakfast at Tiffany's. Truman Capote, one of the greats. And later made into a movie uh, starring Audrey Hepburn. And I think Audrey Hepburn was a patient of Dr. Jacobson. Right, it's not the six degrees of separation for Dr. Jacobson. It's more, probably more like one or two degrees. And here's one that's really interesting. I didn't, I couldn't place him in this particular roster of people, but that was the great sportscaster Howard Cosell. Remember him? He had the the worst wig in all of show business, but that's Howard Cosell. He's the guy that we both loved and hated at the same time. And um, we all remember that fateful evening when he broke into the Super Bowl to tell the American and the world public that the news had hit that uh, John Lennon, um, I don't think he was a patient of Jacobson, but he was a heroin freak, thanks to Yoko Ono, I think. Uh, he broke into the ABC uh, Super Bowl broadcast to inform us that John Lennon, John Winston Lennon, named after Winston Churchill, who was, by the way, a client of or a patient of Dr. Jacobson, to inform the American public that John Winston Lennon had been assassinated. And it goes high. I, I mentioned JFK. It goes high up into the political realm. Harry S. Truman himself was treated, I don't know regularly or not, but he is on the patient roster of Dr. Jacobson. I wonder how the authors, and I couldn't really find this, I wonder how the authors found out these names, because supposedly this material is supposed to be confidential, right? Um, it, and we all know by now there's no such thing as confidentiality. But anyway, okay, the Everly Brothers, uh, Elizabeth Taylor, man, see her in the film, or if you're lucky enough, the stage play, uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, right? <laughs> with, with her husband at the time, uh, Richard Burton. Richard Burton and Elizabeth Taylor were patients. And uh, Eddie Fisher, Eddie Fisher was married to Elizabeth Taylor for a short time. I think Elizabeth Taylor left Fisher for Richard Burton. And one of the uh, the products of the Taylor-Fisher marriage was the great Princess Leia, Carrie Fisher, who became, a, from for my money, a, a really good writer. Uh, her books are fantastically good in, in my estimation. So you had people like that. another political figure, you might not remember him, Claude Pepper, he was a senator, Henry Miller, the the author, uh, Jackie Kennedy, we mentioned JFK, but Jackie Kennedy was a patient, so was her sister, Lee Radziwill, and she is nobility, she married into one of the noble houses of Europe, Her she was a Bouvier, so was a so was Jacqueline, um, the, the daughters of the, the famed uh, Black -a Jack, as his nickname was, Bouvier, and we know about JFK, but also JFK's rival, his political rival, and that would be Richard, you won't have me to kick around anymore, Milhouse Nixon. Yes, he was a patient. And now we're getting into some really familiar territory, ladies and gentlemen. We got Nixon, we have Judith Exner Campbell, who was also a patient. Does that ring a bell? Yes, she was the girlfriend of, at the same time, Momo, Sam Giancana, the mafioso, and John F. Kennedy. They were sharing the same woman. And she later came out and talked about this relationship. It, it's not speculation. Most of this material has been independently verified, and the authors are very good at that, which I'll get to in a moment. And keeping on the uh, showgirl slash mafioso theme, Phyllis McGuire was also a patient, and she was linked to Sam Giancana. Sam Giancana was, quote-unquote, dating her, right? and she's part of the McGuire sisters. I just ordered a CD of early McGuire sister hits. I want to listen to Phyllis and her two sisters harmonize. I'm feeling nostalgic for the good old days when gangsters were truly gangsters and they were upright men. They were not these, these people wearing medical smocks wanting to kill humanity. 
right? Speaking of gangsters, we need more men like the man of honor, Vincent Allo. He's known as Jimmy Blue Eyes. He was an associate of the great uh, Meyer Lansky. He was out of that era. That's Vincent, Jimmy Blue Eyes Allo. We need more men of honor like that to bring America back to greatness. They will, they are the people that are going to make America great again because our our law professors, and that includes uh, the great uh, Alan Dershowitz, all those people have abandoned civil liberties. They've turned over th their charge, that is their mandate, their, their, their training over to the globalists. And that's true for our elected leaders, the ones who either elected through um, fairly upright means or the ones that steal elections and the supreme court the whole judiciary the law enforcement we, you, you know the story right so we uh, we're calling on the descendants of the great vincent jimmy blue eyes to to help us out here and also lawyers like the real lawyers like roy Cohn, right I, and of course i was raised to despise him because he was the henchman of uh, joseph mccarthy but he got stuff done you, you get it he was a fixer he got stuff done and that's what we need in 2021. We need men of honor who will get stuff done. Uh, Judy Garland, you know about her case, right? Somewhere under the rainbow and uh, you know, a great talent. She was part of a group called the Gum Sisters, by the way, just for your own trivia knowledge, G-U-M-M. -M. Von Clyburn or Van Clyburn, which is kind of a surprise because he was a, uh, God, he was one of the, people who crossed over from the classical music realm and people on the street knew him and his classical music. And speaking of that, uh, Leonard Bernstein, who did much to popularize not only classical music, but also pop music. Leonard Bernstein was a junkie, a, a legalized junkie under the care of Max Jacobson. And um, this is not too surprising, I guess, uh, a writer that I admire tremendously not only because after he was pretty much banished from Hollywood, he went to Bowling Green State University to teach, to share the insights on screenwriting and being a creative person in Hollywood or elsewhere. That's Rod Serling. And Bowling Green, as many of you know, is where I got my master's degree in popular culture. All right, I'm not new to this. I'm I'm a, one of the pioneers in popular culture studies. Just... Um, just so you know, right? The, those of you who are newbies and are making comments who are telling me I need to look at so-and-so and so-and-so. Been there, done that. Rod Serling, yeah, tw creator of Twilight Zone. Paul Robeson, right? He was the man who was a All-American football player. He had a law degree, I think, from Harvard. Uh, a great stage actor, an operatic level singing. I mean, he had it all. I mean, he was the total. He was also African-American, by the way, right? And this was back, you know, in the late 30s and 40s and 50s. And it's not like, you know, it was really an easy uh, cakewalk for him to 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 reach all these high levels of, of attainment, culturally, politically, athletically, you name it. And uh, many of you know that he was dosed later on and he went through uh, some sort of hallucinogenic freak out. I don't know if Jacobson was involved with it, but I wouldn't put it past Jacobson at all. But but that was our great uh, hero, Paul Robeson. He's another man of honor that we need today in 2021 going into 2022. And uh, Nelson Rockefeller, that's a name. No, that doesn't surprise me. I'm sure all the Rockefellers going back to their great, great, great grandfather, the snake oil salesman, the original guy who was he was on the circuit there selling uh, home remedies to uh, people all over, I think, the Midwest and uh, the Northeast. That's the origins of the Rockefeller Empire, as most of you know. Mickey Mantle, he was in this uh, this uh, slugger derby with Roger Maris, who was on the same team. And um, I think the stress got to him or something, or maybe gave him extra energy. And, hey, maybe Osawa is is on super drugs. I, I think uh, Osawa of the Angels, I think he's probably a Japanese robot or something. <laughs> but, you know, uh, who knows? He's a robo. He's a Mr. Roboto, you know, Su uh, Osawa. And Pat Suzuki, she was Japanese-American. She was an actress at the 1950s. Really good talent. She was on TV a lot as well. When there weren't a lot of Asians on TV, there weren't any, any black, there weren't any 
you know, non-white people on TV when I was growing up. Niels Bohr, he's a physicist, right? You know him, Spiro Agnew, yes, you know that. And then again, the person, uh, the namesake of John Winston uh, Lennon is uh, Winston Churchill. He also was a patient. He got treatment. I don't know if he's a regular patient, probably not, but he was treated. Now, why am I going through these names? Why is this topic so important? Uh, for one thing, I'm seeing on my Patreon list that one of the commenters said, yeah, okay, I, I get it. It's all beginning to make sense. Yeah, yeah, you got it. You got it. You know, you, you're understanding that all these figures, whether they're cultural figures, right, you're, you're Britney Spears, as we talked about last week, or political figures, Joe Biden, you know, Hillary Clinton, uh, Kamala Harris looks whacked out, right? And and, and you're hallucinati. You're you're Elon Musk. We know about him, right? These people are all all uh, you know pretty much uh, incapacitated by by any measure. But they are they are the boss of us, as a six year old would say. They are the boss of me. No, they're not the boss of me. They're illegitimate. They're not even elected by us, and they're being held up like El Cid. You know, El Cid, the guy that was dead, and they put him up on his horse so that. The, uh, the enemy would think that their champion was still, these guys are, these people are biochemical LCID, CID, the CID, right? Who are supposedly intimidating us. Uh, they're not though. No, very few people are really intimidated by all the brave talk about coming in and break down our door and uh, force us into their new biochemical, thanks Dr. Jacobson, their new biochemical regime. So that, that's important, right? And that's why I'm dealing with this. Uh, another commentator or a commenter said that today's preview that on the Patreon, I give a short 30 second preview audio of this book, reminded her of the song by Pink Floyd titled Comfortably Numb. Yes, yes, indeed. And there's a good uh, video that she linked to very much represents. Uh, reminiscent of Clockwork Orange. I remember Malcolm McDowell with his eyelids pulled back, and he has to watch all this, these uh, ultra violence uh, being programmed. And yeah, Pink Floyd. And by the way, all you people out there who made the comments, and you don't watch me regularly, you're a troll or you're an algorithm that said, oh, yeah, the Beatles were the product of, of Tavistock. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Right, all you people there, why don't you go in on Pink Floyd? Because that's a better target for you. Those guys were totally involved with perpetuating, if not supporting, if not being under the control of the biopharmaceutical Burroughs Welcome Combine, not the Beatles. After all, the founding member of Pink Floyd, Sid Barrett, was an acid burnout. He took too much acid, and one day he just never came back from his trip. How do I know? I read the bios on Pink Floyd. I think I'm going to give a talk on Pink Floyd. I'm going to give a talk on David Gilmore, his recording chain, his re the all the effects he used, the echo. And by the way, and when I did the preview, I put my voice through the David Gilmore vocal echo reverberation chain as a form of entrainment. You dig? I did that, and you picked up on it. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, uh, by the way, David Gilmore's uh, father was a professor of this type of work. Uh, he was a biochemist, and guess what? He disappeared one day with his wife. They left Britain, and they emigrated, guess where, too? To America. And Gilmer, Gilmore, and he was only a teen. I think he was. He might have been college, but they're from Cambridge. They're Canterburyian. So, so is Roger Waters. So they were never really accepted by the London set, right? Uh, according to one of their uh, biographers, who I, who I trust. Um, but his father was from that background. So maybe David Gilmore had gone through that whole programming. The founding uh, member, Sid Barrett, that was his brainchild. You know, acid burnout, David Gilmore, who took his place, put took the agenda even further. So I think Pink Floyd is is something that needs to be invested get off the beatles you know paul's dead pid paul is dead and he was replaced by fall all you people are jerkwads and idiots and morons don't don't bother me i'm, I'm pretty much done with you people i, I never <laughs> and you call yourself researchers god it's this guy one guy who was on the paul is dead 
he says, yeah, yeah, I'm going to send you an article about this Italian couple that that found the the the, the truth about Paul is dead. They're so heavily invested in all this garbage. Whereas Pink Floyd is really where we should be looking, and they're still very much in, in play, are, are they not? Including David Gilmore. Has he been knighted yet? He will be, if not, you know, soon. He'll, he'll be knighted. And also, we can't stop at, quote, unquote, Annie Jacobson, right? Because she's published in the last few years this whole series, these mammoth books on the supposed underground history of American institutions. She's a day late and a dollar short, and allowing for inflation, a hundred dollars short. Uh, but her function is to kind of wrap it all up and say, okay, nothing more to see here, people move along. No, we're this. you said case closed, we're going to keep pushing on, you and me. And um, Seagoss uh, has is checking out something about Annie Jacobson, and I'm not going to ruin it for him if he comes <laughs> if he comes up with some information here. So there's a lot of you know Annie Jacobson type of chaff being thrown out by big publishing and big academia. You know, you got your Brett Weinstein. Uh, you know, after Jordan Peterson started to go off the rails with his pharmaceutical problems, right? There's a case in point there. Uh, they brought in uh, Brett Weinstein over at Portland State to act as sort of the, the uh, limited hangout. And I mentioned these two guys because their names come up in my comments all the time. When I'm supposed to go to them to, to really understand what's going on in the world. Come on, get off of it. Go home. Take your ball with you, all right? So Dr. Feelgood, the book... Uh, also, uh, you know, is, is being uh, deprived of oxygen. This, these authors here by these uh, ass clowns, um, and that's one of the reasons why I need, I need to talk about them. By the way, I'm going to give a shout out to Skyhorse Publishing, who did this book. They're doing a lot of really important book releases, uh, especially now. And uh, the reason I found out, I found this out at a dinner conversation. I gave a talk at NYU and um, uh, Dale Big Mouth was there, Dale, Dale Big Tree, he was there. He tried to, you know, take all the action out of the room. And I had to go up there and say, hey, man, you, you know, you left me only a few minutes. So I'm going to tell the students what I really believe, you know, and that is 90 percent uh, eradication rate of all humanity. And that really upset um, Dale Big Mouth. Uh, at the beginning of the talk, he was very friendly to me. But after that, he shot out of the room, the classroom, like a bat out of hell. And he's another guy that offers no solution to anybody, right? So thank you very much, Dell Big Mouth. And, you know, congratulations on your your affiliation with Bobby Kennedy Jr., who I do respect. Uh, anyway, what, when I um, was there, there was a guy who had published a book on autism, two books on autism. And he comes from the business world and he comes from his, the both books were published by Skyhorse. So at the dinner, I asked him, hey, how did you get on with Skyhorse? Because, you know, I'm a writer and I, I want to know about publishers. How do they treat their writers and and whatnot? Are they going to give me any trouble? Are they going to give you a contract and then sit on you? Right. That's a technique to to prevent you from ever getting your work out there. And he says, well, you know, the, the publisher, the, the editor in chief of Skyhorse is also has a child who has been diagnosed diagnosed with autism. And so he, he was very much interested in doing that, that type of publishing in this particular, and that's how he got the contract. And uh, they're very good as a consequence, Pi Skyhorse Publishing, where it comes to the V word, right? I'm not gonna use the full word, it's the V word. So Skyhorse, thank you very much. As, in addition to, to my own publisher, uh, Trine Day, right? So check, check their, their, uh, their list out. Uh, also, the public, that's us. We need to know about the health of its elective officials, right? Or these self-appointed leaders, cultural leaders, right? Your, your uh, Donnie O'Sullivan's of CNN or uh, some of these clowns. Uh, man, they look like they're totally whacked out. Uh, Brian Set Seltzer, is it? Or Setzer and the, these other characters man they they who is their dr um jacobson right but we need to know about the health of these individuals not to the point of invading their privacy like they they need to do to us but we have to to un, just assume i think that they are being controlled by powerful 
uh, hallucinogens or some sort of um, methamphetamine type of um, concoction. I, 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 there's no other or prop. And by the way, I, I think it's going on beyond the pharmaceuticals. I think we're getting into EMF. I think we're going to electronic. Uh, and, and there are people who are doing that type of work, uh, critical work, research on on that. And that's another talk. So I don't want to just focus strictly on pharmaceutical. I don't in my own research. I talk about EMF and other technologies, right? And there are workarounds, right? This is the Schumann resonance. This is the the resonance. It's a of the of the Earth itself. Um, and you notice when the League of Women Voters was hosting the presidential debates, it was not off limits to talk about the health including the mental health of, of the candidates. But when the networks, when CNN and, and Fox News and phone news, and when they took over, that was off limits. And now we have to just deal with uh, people on these conspiracy sites who are of limited use as well, I think. Okay, I'm going to move on because um, I want to get into some, some really important aspects of uh, Dr. Jacobson himself. And I think this is another one of the strengths, because most of you know the stories behind all the celebs that I mentioned, and I don't, I don't need to rehearse them, but not very many of you, or certainly I didn't, know about uh, Dr. Max uh, Jakobsen. Well, for one thing, uh, Jakobsen, as a, before he came to America and set up shop on 72nd Street and 3rd Avenue in Manhattan, he was uh, under National Socialist sponsorship. He was a medical doctor under uh, National Socialism. Yes, he was a Jew, and he was uh, under the gun, uh, literally, uh, along with other profes uh, professionals. But the Third Reich health officials found that his work, it came to their attention, was, was invaluable to their own political and military agenda. So they brought him in. Because by the time um, Hitler came into power, Max Jakobsen was already known amongst the elite, the literary, political, banking, you know, business community elite in Berlin for his so-called vitamin cocktail. He was very much a pioneer in B, vitamin B therapy. And uh, his father, by the way, was a butcher uh, in Berlin, in the uh, commercial se sector of, of Berlin. He was a butcher. And uh, but he 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 was a butcher according to uh, kosher laws and practice, and there's a certain protocol there. And, and Jakobsen, as a child, was able to see this, and a lot of it uh, concerns the blood, blood chemistry, and bloodletting. And uh, and I mention this because uh, Jakobsen, as a medical student and, and definitely as a professional, a certified MD, uh, was very much interested in using animal. Uh, byproducts like uh, animal placentas and um, other types of concoctions. So that you have the the sort of the the beginnings of uh, chimeric or chimeric, if you will, uh, types of uh, combinations combined with vitamin therapy and the good old standby methamphetamine. Now let's talk about methamphetamine very briefly. Um, it was discovered by a Japanese scientist in 1919. And I'll bet you anything that scientist, the Japanese scientist, probably learned his his uh, pharmaceutical um, skills in Germany and Berlin because they were they were top, right? They were they were number one and they still are. Um, and it was marketed as a wonder drug. It took you know a few years, 19 by 1937 the American Medical Association had approved the tablet version of methamphetamine for prescription use. So it's been around, you know, for, for quite a while. Now a familiar name, at least familiar to the people here in the chat. Burroughs Welcome branded methamphetamine with its own trademark, and they called it methadrine. And they started real their Burroughs Welcome is such a great marketing institution. That's really what they you know, we know about uh, Burroughs and Welcome. But I think Welcome was the the American and Bur uh, Burroughs was the British guy that came together. But today they're very good at, at monopolizing pat patents and marketing their goods. So they were they they really started to take off in the 1950s when methadrine was being distributed uh, willy nilly to a lot of the people, not just through Max Jacobson, but throughout the entire society. And by the way, not coincidentally, this is also when psychotherapy started 
taking off in the 1950s. So you see the the or the the growth of psych, Freudian psychotherapy, Carl Jung, uh, and and crew and uh, pharmaceuticals uh, running as a dual rail through American and international culture beginning in the 1950s. By the way, I mentioned Carl U, uh, Gustav Jung. For those who were in the Petra and premiere, you know that. Uh, yeah, I already mentioned that. Uh, uh, Max uh, Jakobsen was a, I won't say disciple or even a student, but he was very well um, acquainted with uh, uh, Carl Jung, Sigmund Freud, and Alfred Adler, right? These are these are like major figures in, in the world of psychology. And that is in keeping with what I understand Jakobsen, Jakobsen to be, which is a healer, a mystic, as well, who also considered considered himself a scientist, but so did Jung, so so did Adler, and so did Freud. They considered themselves men of science. And I mention this is because these people who were uh, allowing us to be the boss of us, as we used to say when we were six years old, "You're not the boss of me." The people who were allowing ourselves to be the boss of us, they were may wear the smock, right? But they are mostly uh, shaman. I mean, shamanism probably works, right? If you're a believer, right? You tell enough people, you, someone, you're, they're going to die. They, they probably will at a certain point if they're a believer. Uh, but there, there is much mystics and uh, hocus pocus people, uh, Barnum type uh, uh, circus barkers as they are people of science. Just keep that in mind. The next time you hear that, that Asian woman telling us uh, how we need to be disciplined to to make it painful for us to uh, walk out as free human beings, right? Uh, they're flim flam artists, first and foremost. And until you prove otherwise, you people in the medical uh, jackets, you have no credibility uh, in, in the society. And that's not me saying that. That's that's the majority of Americans nowadays. By any survey you want to look at, medical profession, bleh, going, except for the few heroes, going down, 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 along with uh, journalism, and uh, uh, they haven't caught up with the justice system yet, but uh, you, you're next on the list uh, because two, gen two or three generations of you have, have been in, in, the, in the law field, thanks to your professors of law at all the great universities. Uh, you have been indoctrinated into New World Order techno-oppression, and it will not stand. So he was under sponsorship of National Socialism. Uh, 1932, by that time, uh, Jewish professor, professionals, in particular, you know, lawyers, whoever else, they had to, they had to split. You know, he could, they could see the writing on the wall. So Jacobson, Jacobson went to Czechoslovakia. He went to Prague, right, the home of, uh, of uh, Max Brod and, uh, you know, pe people of that literary and set, right, internationalist, international. And then he went to Perry. Uh, Franz Kafka, right? Max Brod, uh, I've talked about him in the past. Then he went to Paris. Then from Paris, he went to New York. And um, there, as I mentioned earlier, he found a receptive clientele and patient list amongst the German, Austrian, and um, as well as native-born American uh, creative uh, community. Now, this is where I don't say I disagree with the authors, Lutzman and Burns, but they don't really cover the fact, the possibility that uh, Dr. Jakobsen was sent to New York. He was sent there. It's not so much, yeah, it was getting hot for him in, in uh, Nazi Germany, the Third Reich, right, for all pro Jewish professionals, right? They had to split. Yeah, true. But there's also, uh, I think, a strong possibility by their own account but they don't really draw that connection. I, I'm drawing that connection. There's a strong possibility that uh, Jakobsen was being sent to New York in order to filter into the commute of intellectual community, the political establishment by foreign forces. Uh, it could have been Soviet because Dr. Jakobsen, back in Berlin, his student days, as well as in Praha, pra, um, Prague, you know, Czechoslovakia and Perry, up to New York, he was he associated with communists. But a lot of intellectuals and professionals were communists because communism, and I'm not justifying it, but communism was was the 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 most uh, substantial bulwark against fascism, Nazism, right? So that's why a lot of people. So I don't, you know, I don't know. We need to know more about uh, Dr. Jacobson's uh, affiliation with, with communists, but. Because he had those affiliations, he came under the 
scrutiny of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And by the way, J. Edgar Hoover was also a patient at one time and the Central Intelligence Agency. So this is a, I won't say a gap because they do cover it, but this is a, an area of inquiry that, that requires further research. That is, was Dr. Jakobsen part of the, the, the poisoning, right? You know the Stephen Kinzer book, Poisoner in Chief? Was he part of the poisoning of the American Republic, right? Was he an asset? Because, you know, we know the British did that to China. You know, they fought two wars, the two opium wars over that. And we think, oh, isn't that terrible? You know, let's let you know that you know it is terrible. But do you think that the United States would be immune from that type of attack on a similar level? We're still under that attack. Have you heard about the opium or the opioid crisis recently? Have you heard of? Have you been following George Webb's great reportage on vaping, right, and the possibilities <laughs> there? I don't, you know, need to go there. You've been watching the show. No, it's very much with us in 2021. And Jakobsen, I think, was an early sign that where where the uh, New World Order, if I may use the expression, New World Order bankers were taking us. We, we normies, every you know, the creative community, political elite, as well as everyday people, into medical pharmaceutical uh, zombification. Right. So Jakobsen winds up uh, to make a long story short. He winds up in America in 1936. This, you know, we're getting into World War II Eve time, right? 39, it busts out. 41, America gets in. Uh, and this is where an OSS officer enters into the picture. And this is something for you researchers to follow up on. And I'm going to be looking for his name hereafter. His name is Mark Shaw, S-H-A-W. He was, and he came in after World War II, but he was a quote unquote former OSS officer. And you know what OSS means, right? It stands for Oh So Social, which means CIA. It's the white shoe boys, right? Dulles, and you know the story. So Mark Shue, uh, Shaw came out of that, that world, OSS, espionage. And he was, and according to this, they used the acronym themselves, the authors, right? He was a NOC, an NOC. He was a non official cover officer for the CIA. This is Mark Shaw. And you know what his legend was? And I've talked about this before in other contexts, not Mark Shaw specifically, but you know I like to go in on Anna Winter, right? Otherwise known as Nuclear Winter, right? The Devil Wears Prada Winter. I know. How come all these Brits are involved in, in American publishing, especially in fashion? Well, part of Mark Shaw, the OSS man, uh, part of his legend was that he was a fashion photographer for the ladies' fashion magazines. Maybe he didn't work for Anna Nuclear Wintour. And by the way, Anna Anna Winter's father was was uh, an intelligence uh, asset. He was known as Chili Charlie Winter, right? He was he was in publishing, and he's the one that set her up. He says, "No, you're going to go into women's publishing." So he he was a knock, Mark Shaw. He was an informant during the fifties that are conveniently. The shorthand is the McCarthy era, and I'm not going to get into, yeah, okay, you know, uh, M. Stanton Evans, yeah, you wrote a book, yeah, I, I, I know, okay, so don't bother leaving the comment. He was an informant during the McCarthy era, and as a fashion photographer, he was the, quoting the authors, the consummate fly on the wall. He had access, and these are people who are thinking, oh, you know, I'm, I'm getting fitted, and I'm doing uh, some just casual, uh, you know, off the record type of um, uh, indulging in, in uh, haute couture, right? And they're they're free with the words, and they feed them, uh, you know, they give them champagne while they're getting uh, fitted and all that. And he, you know, they're taking pictures, right? And and he's he's getting all this information. Where's all that information going to? Yes, you know it, right? I don't have to spell it out to you. You're smart. And not only this, uh, I don't know why I, I find this amusing, but. This is how, how this is how it operates. Mark Shaw was invited into the White House to live there by our beloved martyred president, John F. Kennedy. He was invited by JFK to live at the White House. No, I'm sorry, Jacobson, not, not Shaw. Jacobson, but his buddy Mark Shaw became the official photographer to the Kennedy family during the two and a half years that John F. Kennedy was our president before he was whacked. Right, that's Mark Shaw. So you had an OSS guy, a knock, in that with access to the most 
well, not most. I don't know if he's in their bedroom. I wouldn't doubt it. You know, when John F. Kennedy or whatever, wherever he was doing his dirty deeds, right? It certainly wasn't with Jackie Kennedy. You know, I think they were on pretty much on the outs by that time. I think they had separate bedrooms even. But he had access to the whole uh, back scenes, uh, back, back, not back scene, the back scene goings on of the Kennedy uh, administration. He was the official Kennedy family uh, photographer. And as I jumped the gun a moment ago, uh, Dr. Jacobson himself was invited by JFK to move into the White House because he needed them. So you know about JFK's health problems. I mean, he had Addison's disease. He had the back problems. He was a heavy drinker. He smoked cigars. Uh, I mean, he had every single vice that a lot of real, you know, action-oriented men of the past had. I mean, that's how a lot of men lived back in the uh, 1940s and 50s. Um, remember, they, they grew up under war. I mean, John F. Kennedy, whatever problem you have with him, he was a veteran. He was in the Pacific Theater, and he was fighting the enemy. He he was living life um, uh, under extreme pressure, and I'm not justifying, but but a lot of these young men figured, hey, I, you know, I might be dead anyway, so I'm going to smoke, I'm going to drink, I'm going to whore, I'm going to whatever, you know, because I, I, I might be dead tomorrow. So they picked up a lot of habits, and besides, they were getting free cigarettes put in their uh, narrations by the, guess what, the, the tobacco, <laughs> the tobacco companies, which addicted a whole uh, generation of men, young men of that time to cigarettes. That's my dad's story. He was a smoker for, for many years. He finally, he, he kicked though. He quit. Um, so anyway, uh, there were people, there were establishment doctors who Jacobson was uh, he, they reviled him. They felt that he was a snake oil salesman. And by the way, Jacobson was under uh, harsh indictment by a lot of his patients later on. So he wasn't fooling everybody. But Dr. Janet Travell, who was the personal physician of John F. Kennedy, and Dr. Eugene J. Cohen, who was also a physician. I think with Dr. Travell was the main one, but Dr. Cohen was also some. But they were establishment old time doctors where were. It was a sacred relationship almost, right? But they brought in Jacobs in there, the OS has probably CIA, they brought him in there to kind of break those people, uh, peel them off so that they could, you know, the in intelligence people could have more direct access to uh, President Kennedy. So in a certain sense, you know, the needle did uh, John F. Kennedy in too, not just the bullets, right? So how did they managed to control Jacobson. Well, for one thing, he was a meth head himself. And it was, this goes back to his medical apprenticeship, his training, his student years, and I guess even his early years of his profession. He saw himself as a man of science. He tested out a lot of his concoctions on his own person. And this was common practice back then. Uh, today, they uh, these cowards typically use prisoners, students, and uh, military personnel to do their experiments. But in the old days, they would do it to themselves before they would harm any other uh, individual. And uh, not to mention animals, lab rats, um, primates, and uh, uh, rodents primarily. But Jacobson, uh, Jacobson tested himself and he became an ad. He was a lifeline. So he was half whacked out most of the time either. And he always had these feelings of grandiosity and, hey, I'm Superman, no one can touch, you know, that whole uh, meth head type of uh, uh, way of being in the world, right? Uh, and Jakobsen went, you know, he was being criticized and monitored by the FCC and all these different, for years and years and years. And this tells me, again, this indicates, implies to me why he was able to get away with what he's doing for so long. He was being allowed to practice. But as I mentioned at the top of this talk, they finally rolled him up, just like you people, like that woman, that Asian American woman, Vietnamese American, who says, "You are not going. You're gonna. We're gonna make you suffer if you decide not to go with our medical tyranny. Uh, you're gonna be rolled up, just as Dr. Uh, Jakobsen is rolled up in 1975. He had his finally had his medical license revoked, and and he he was done. He was finished even before then, because by that time they got the whole American public involved in in meth, right? Now there were other. I'm running. You know, and I'm not complaining, okay? I'm just right at the end of my hour here. But let me leave you with this for all the, Paul is dead. It, the Beatles are a Tavistock concoction. I'll leave you with this. 
uh, boneheads. Uh, there was another guy who was, it, it wasn't just Max y Jakobson. That's what the books are about. There were, there were several of them, these amphetamine doctors, as uh, the authors call them. And the most prominent of them, and he was prominent for a reason I will explain in a moment, was a person by the name of Dr. Robert Freinmann. Freinmann. And he also was a uh, an expat. He, he re relocated from New York to Nazi Germany. And I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, I don't think it was just a matter of being a Jew in Germany, having to get out and come to New York. That was one of the push factors. One of the pull factors is that U.S. intelligence wanted these high-level scientists and physicians to be part of their control uh, apparatus, right? Okay, and, and the authors don't talk about that part of it. That's what I'm contributing to the discussion. Anyway, Dr. Robert Feynman became immortalized by, yes, all you anti-Beatles haters. <laughs> the Beatles. Um, the, uh, Dr. Feynman, uh, and his first name is Robert, right? Feynman was immortalized by that Beatles tune called, yes, do you know it? I'm looking in the comments. What is it? What's that song that the Beatles wrote as an homage, a backhanded homage to Dr. Robert Feynman? Yes, bright more dinosaur. You got it. You win the prize. I don't know what the prize is. You get a free uh, vibrational Schumann resonance here. I'm sorry. The microphone was temporarily disabled by the powerful uh, Schumann resonance, and I'm back now. Um, I think. Yes, Dr. Robert, uh, the Beatles, uh, when they were in New York, uh, cupcake explosion. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. They keep talking about Joe Biden being the H. George says he is H as in him. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if Kissinger was on drugs. He seems like it. Uh, no, this is not the, the uh, surely you're joking, Dr. Feynman. He was the physicist, the Caltech physicist. Um, he was very much a New World Order character. This is a uh, the MD, Robert Freeman, spelled differently, F-R-E-Y-N-M-A-N-N, -N -N. okay? Yeah, thank you, ECAT, for appreciating my twisted humor. Uh, most For most people, it just goes <laughs> like right over there. They just think I'm eccentric. <laughs> they don't realize, how, like George Carlin, you know, how, how, how difficult humor is. Uh, you got to work at it, you know, just like every every other craft or skill or talent out there. And I'm not on drugs either, you know. I, I'm on I'm on the Schumann resonance, and I'm also hardwired. I'm not on uh, the five G uh, tip either. So, uh, and also one of the as I'll conclude on this uh, one of the tragic victims of Dr. Robert Dr. Robert Freeman was the great yard bird himself, Charlie Parker. Man, that guy was dead. I think, what, 32, 35? He looked like it was like 55, Charlie Parker. So this is how, and, you know, back then, as today in 2021, this is how the med medical, the pharma, pharmaceutical medical tyranny will get to targeted people. Now they're, 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 their sites are on the entire population. So let's learn from that, ladies and gentlemen. And I will see you on Thursday with another exciting, informative, and completely side-splitting, hilarious talk for you in a couple of days. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> we'll see you then. I appreciate you being with me today. Thank you very much. And uh, remember, get in tune with the Schumann resonance. He was also German, by the way. <laughs> okay. Bye. See you later.